Thank you very much for that uh, introduction and also for the invitation to um, to be here today. Um, we're going to start off with a um, brief overview of what I plan to um, to cover. So I'm viewing this as kind of a introduction and overview of the field of metabolomics, uh, particularly in terms of the application to systems biology and drug discovery. I'm really going to focus on highlighting on some of the current challenges and sources of error and highlight <clears throat> um, standard experimental protocols, the role of statistics, um, talking about sample preparation, data acquisition, application of multivariate universe statistics, and end up with an idea in terms of how we might be able to go ahead and improve the application in terms of metabolomics. So this is a start off to put everybody in kind of a common um, framework. Uh, metabolomics has really evolved to be an important aspect in terms of systems biology. And when we think about system biology, it's kind of the opposite of our traditional approach to science, you know, this reductionist approach where we might look at an isolated uh, protein or an isolated gene. The idea is to kind of put things back into the cell, to look at the larger picture, to, to examine what's happening at the organism tissue or cell level. In this matter, omics then becomes a really invaluable um, tool and asset. And most of you are probably familiar with the more traditional fields in terms of omics. Genomics, when we're looking at monitoring changes in gene expression. Or proteomics, when we're looking at monitoring changes in terms of the protein expression overall to give us an overall view in terms of the system. But we have to remember uh, at this particular level, we see an increase in the amount of gene or protein that doesn't mean that it implies an increase or a change in activity. So it's the metabolome. Our the metabolome is going to be the collection of all the metabolites, the small molecular weight cut off probably around 1,000, 1,200 Daltons that are present in whatever the biological system that we're looking at. And of course, this covers a wide variety in terms of systems that we can think about. Whether or not we're talking about a whole plant or cell line or tissue or a whole organism like C. elegans or actually biofluids like um, serum or urine coming from humans or animals. We're going to go ahead and try to essentially characterize all these metabolites, all these small mo molecules that are present in this system to understand how um, they respond to some sort of environmental or genetic um, stress or from a disease state or, or a drug. Right? We're looking at, again, using the metabolites as being a characterizing the phenotype or measuring the function of some particular process. So metabolomics is then part of this entire cas omics cascade. <clears throat> We're at the front end, we see genomics, which is really telling us what might happen. And the value in terms of interest or in terms of metabolomics is telling us what is happening. You know, if you see suddenly an upregulation alpha ketoglutarates, or downregulation in terms of alanine, that has to occur through some sort of change in the system, some change in activity of an enzyme or a protein, even if it just amounts to up increasing the uptake or excretion of that particular amino acid. And again, that puts um, the metabolome in a relatively unique um, position where it really reflects the overall state of the biological system that we're interested in. And again, as I said before, you really can't make that conclusion with tra uh, genomics, transcriptomics, or proteomics. Again, those changes don't necessarily lead to a definitive um, change in the system, biological activity, and so forth. So the overall, again, the goal of metabolomics <clears throat> is to characterize the difference between two or more groups right, resulting from some sort of perturbation of that system, some sort of external and potentially even internal stress. Uh, the idea is that we're going to go ahead and <clears throat> collect the metabolome, characterize the metabolome by NMR and mass spec, identify the metabolites, the, the metabolic associations, go ahead and look at my network. In essence, we're going to characterize the state of the system, what metabolites pathway is different, and this requires re multiple replicates in order to capture the, the normal biological variance. 
Then we're going to apply a variety of different types of statistical approaches and then, of course, some modeling network analysis to go ahead and get us this characterization aspect. So in this concept, there are kind of two general um, categories in terms of metabolomics that are routinely employed. There is targeted metabolomics and untargeted or global metabolomics. As the name implies, target metabolomics, we have a defined set of metabolites that we're going to go ahead and characterize and monitor. These are generally very well established, uh, uh, calibrated and robust assays, but we're going to be limited to this set of metabolites. The advantage in terms of untargeted metabolomics is that we're going to try to monitor the entire metabolome or everything that we can detect. It tends to be hypothesis generating or discovery based. And this usually is focused on um, characterizing the difference again between two or more classes to go ahead and identify what is the nature of that, of that difference between the two different groups. Commonly, there are two analytical techniques that are used to analyze the metabolome, those being NMR and mass spec. There are other techniques too, like FTIR and so forth. But clearly, NMR and mass spec are the two major um, tools used. And unfortunately, a lot of times they're used independently, uh, despite the fact that they have a very nice high, the complementary um, characteristic, right? So NMR is typically going to be limited to the most abundant metabolites, usually maybe greater than one micromolar. Um, but there's a lot of easiness in terms of applying NMR. It's easy to do high throughput, doesn't require any sample handling. It's non-destructive, and NMR is also very easily quantifiable. Uh, mass spec generally requires adding a chromatography like GC or LC. Uh, it's going to have a much higher sensitivity and resolution and dynamic range than NMR, but it's also going to be typically limited to uh, metabolites that are readily ionizable, and of course, metabolites that we can separate and detect by chromatography. As soon as we touch or handle the system, we inadvertently perturb the system. So that is one of the particular challenges there. But again, I can stress that these two techniques are highly complementary. When they're both applied, they tend to cover different metabolites, different parts of the metabolome. Um, and so therefore, it's a clear advantage to combining both of these. And that's a point I'm going to highlight. So again, giving all these reasons here. Uh, metabolomics continues to experience a great exponential um, growth. Uh, it is being applied to just about every type of biological field you can think of. And again, commonly being used for biomarker discovery, for uh, personalized medicine being used to help diagnose diseases, um, to, uh, for drug discovery, but of course is applied to other areas like food and nutrition, environmental studies, and so forth. And I think one of the advantages that metabolomics has, part of the reason why it's experiencing the particular growth, is that there's a relatively low barrier to en entry. Uh, it's a standard methodology that can be applied to just about any field, any type of uh, system. And I think that's a real strength uh, of metabolomics, right? In the context, in terms of um, drug discovery, um, one of the aspects I think metabolomics can help um, solve is kind of the long-standing challenge that the field is having um, that we seen this linear decrease in terms of the return on investments and especially in areas like um, drug antibiotic discovery there's a drastic drop off in amount of interest and in research pursuing that and of course we have this randomness associated with the likelihood of discovering a new particular drug and a lot of the reasons why we're not seeing a lot of not in innovation or creativity, there's a lot of effort focus on uh, Me Too drugs or expanded or reuse in terms of those particular drugs. So metabolomics can come in and try, basically kind of help and resolve some of these particular issues and problems. Uh, metabolomics can be part of the very traditional structure-based drug design effort uh, where it can be incorporated into this normal process is normal evolution in terms of new leads from uh, high throughput screening by answering some very, very fundamental questions that other standard uh, assays do not provide. Uh, for instance, when you're developing a drug, you want to identify what is actually um, the active um, version of the drug in vivo, what's the mechanism of action, are there any toxicity issues, are there off-target effects, 
And when it comes to personalized medicine, you want to go ahead and monitor the treatment efficacy. You want to be, go ahead and monitor drug resistance or be able to diagnose the disease and its progression, right? And again, the tabulomics being at this ability to monitor the state of the system, uh, effectively the phenotype or the monitor in terms of the functions of genes, uh, this becomes a very valuable um, approach when we think about developing a new drug. So, like I said, um, metabolomics has a low barrier to entry, and at first appearance, it looks like it's a very simple um, system, very simple um, protocol. You're going to go ahead and collect your biological samples, whether or not it's bi um, biofluids or cells or tissues. You're going to go through a, a very simple um, process to go ahead and extract the metabolome from these biological samples. You're going to go ahead and then collect 1D NMR or uh, mass spectra data of these metabolome aspects and then put these spectral data in kind of some um, standard statistical packages and try to identify um, the differences uh, between them. So you can again get back to this point and characterize the state of the system, what metabolites pathways um, differ. Again, we need multiple replicates to capture the natural biological variants. So again, sounds very easy, and the result is that there are hundreds and not thousands of papers now being submitted in terms of the application, in terms of metabolomics to a variety of different topics. And as I said, uh, NMR is a primary analytical tool, and as diagrammed here, commonly one-dimensional NMR, proton NMR is a source of um, metabolomics data, where essentially you get a very complex um, spectrum uh, where the relative presence and the intensity of all these peaks tell us what metabolites are present. Uh, occasionally, also two-dimensional NMR is uh, applied. We get greater um, resolution in terms of the, the data and a broader coverage in terms of metabolites, and this gives us also higher confidence in actually annotating and identifying the metabolites that are, that are present. And like I said, multivariate statistics is the primary tool that is used to, to analyze the NMR spectra, uh, primarily because in most cases, it's very difficult or challenging and time consuming to go through and try to identify every peak that's present in the spectrum, identify that peak to a particular, assign that peak to metabolite and quantify the intensity of that peak. Uh, multivariate statistics kind of uh, simplifies to some aspect of that work. And what I'm doing here is briefly summarizing conceptually what is happening when we're dealing with uh, multivariate statistics like principal component analysis or um, PLS. We can think about a 1D NMR spectra as actually multidimensional. Right? We have chemical shifts along the x-axis and the relative intensity of the peaks along the y-axis. And a multivariate statistical technique is going to go ahead and take this NMR spectrum and convert it into a single point in multidimensional space. Uh, and this multidimensional space might actually be the digital resolution of your spectrum, 16, 32, 64K where each axis corresponds to a specific chemical ship value. And then the value along that particular axis is the intensity of that particular peak. So while it's very difficult to actually visualize this 16,000 um, space um, images, um, it's very simple to go ahead and do this in terms of a computer system, in terms of uh, applying very simple matrix algebra where each row corresponds to an NMR spectrum. And what the statistical techniques are then doing is within this multidimensional space, it's gonna find the vector that corresponds to the largest variance between our two classes, our two particular groups. This gets referred to as PC1. It finds a second vector orthogonal to the first that captures the second largest variation in data. And this becomes PC2. And of course, this can go on for multiple different um, values. But just in this particular case, we now have a two-dimensional plane in this multidimensional space. And then we project back down in this plane 
we get what's referred to as a, as a scores plot, where hopefully we're going to see a large variations or separation in terms of the group, where this variation, this separation is really capturing the major spectral differences between the NMR data. Right. We can now start looking at the relative um, distribution of our various different groups into these scores plots to then start inferring some concept in terms of biological significance. So what I have here is kind of a simple cartoon illustration in terms of how we can go use metabolomics, how we can use these PCA scores plots to characterize the relative activity of a novel drug. In this case, what we have is some wild type cell line and a mutant cell line where the mutant cell line has the protein that's the presumed target of the drug inactivated. And so the wild type of mutant cell lines are going to have very different metabolomes and they're going to be highly separated in this scores plot. Now they go ahead and treat the wild type cells with my drug and the mutant cells with my drug. Right. And if the drug is inactive, what we see is no difference that the wild type cells with the drug cluster with the wild type, mutant cells with the drug cluster with the mutant cells. But if the drug has a desirable outcome, it's active and selective, we're going to get this relative pattern, where again, we see a large difference between the wild type and the mutant, right, based on the knockout in terms of that particular protein. But now the mutant cells and the mutant cells with the drugs and wild type with the drug all clustered together, they're all showing the same relative change in the metabolome because either genetically in terms of mutation or chemically due to the drug, they've knocked out the same particular protein leading to the same change in the metabolome. And we get different patterns if the drug is active but not selective or if we're actually um, going down the wrong path and our drug is actually targeting an incorrect um, protein. So again, this is how the metabolome, characterizing the metabolome allows us to go ahead and understand um, biological processes like drug activities. We can go to the next step in terms of our statistical analysis here. So after we see that we get various different separations in groups based on the the nature of the drug or the chemical stressor. We can apply other statistical techniques uh, like S plots, volcano plots, identifying fold chains, um, VIP, and identify those spectral features that primarily differentiate between the different groups. And then if we identify those spectral features, those peaks, we can assign those peaks to metabolites and quantify the relative change in that particular metabolite. Then with identifying all the various metabolites that are changed, we can go ahead and superpose those onto networking analysis. And again, identify the actual overall response, changes in perturbation and metabolic processes. That's a result of our drug or external stress or genetic mutation or, or what have you. So this becomes the basic idea, the basic approach, right? Collect the metabolome, represent the metabolome by NMR and mass spec data, list statistical analysis, identify that there is difference, what's the nature of that difference, and move forward, right? But <clears throat> the process itself is actually very complex. It involves multiple steps, multiple division points, multiple ma manipulation of the sample and the spectral data and statistical analysis. A lot of this being very manual in that process. So it's very easy to go ahead and introduce errors at any one of these particular steps or decision points. So what we really have to think about when we're concerned about applying, applying metabolomics is making sure, are these metabolome changes that we're seeing, are they biologically relevant? And are our measurements, right, however we're going about doing that, an accurate and reproducible characterization of these biological changes, right? And the reason why we have to be uniquely concerned about metabolomics compared to other omics, compared to looking at proteins or genomes or RNA and so forth, is that the metabolome itself, these small molecular weight molecules are extremely sensitive to handling and storing. Uh, basically, there are enzymes that are involved in these metabolic processes that can turn over 
a molecule within milliseconds. And so if we want to really truly capture the real state of the biological system, we need to essentially shut off all this enzymatic activity and do that quickly and efficiently. Uh, when you harvest cells or remove tissues from a, an animal, as soon as you start doing that, you start introducing unnatural states, right? Cell death or somewhere along those lines, right? And those responses can occur in the millisecond time range. And the metabolites themselves has been very well documented and they vary across the entire collection are not particularly stable themselves, right? Uh, again, they are thermodynamically not stable. They can easily oxidize uh, and get converted into other particular metabolites. And there's been numerous studies where you simply take a metabolic sample, put it on the bench top, and measure it a couple of hours later. You see vast differences. You can even see this. We've seen it ourselves in terms of storing a sample at minus 80 degrees, pulling the sample out a week later, and it's completely different in terms of what its chemical composition and makeup is. So not only is the metabolome uh, sensitive, but it's also responsive in terms of how we handle and analyze the sample. So this is some recent data that um, we reported where we go ahead and compare four different liquid chromatography protocols. So we're perturbing the solvent, the runtime, the flow rate, the gradient, and so forth. And by perturbing this, what we see is essentially completely different um, metabolite profiles. Uh, we see a completely different collection of what lipids are present, the relative intensity of those particular uh, lipids, to the point that only 11 to 34% of the lipids identified across these four different profiles are the same. And this is regardless of the fact that it's the same students, the same instrumentation, the same column, the same sample that's being injected sequentially by just changing the LC protocol, having this drastic impact, right? So extremely sensitive is not an overstatement in terms of what the metabolome is. Making matters even worse, right, is how we actually analyze the metabolome, how we analyze the spectral data can get us very different results. Uh, so this is a paper that we, it's submitted under review at um, Analytical Chemistry, where we compared the outcome of three different common softwares, our own software, MVA Pack versus MS Dial and XCMS, using again a very standardized um, LCMS um, data set, and we see the same result. Right, that even if it's the same students, the same general parameterization, but the three different software yields to a completely different set of features and a different set of metabolites that are identified. Essentially, 79% of the features are unique across these data sets, even though it's the exact same spectrum. Again, so this raises a lot of issues and a lot of concerns in terms of the accuracy and reproducibility of metabolomics data. On top of that, we have this particular problem that the majority of the metabolome is unknown. Uh, myself and other colleagues published a paper a few years ago where we estimated a number of metabolites, and we guessed that there's somewhere around 150,000, 200,000, or a million in plants. But when we think about a standard metabolomics experiment using mass spec or NMR, at most we're detecting or measuring a few hundred, really a small fraction of what the actual true metabolome is. And so clearly, again, one analytical method is not going to cover all the metabolome, combining NMR, mass spec, and other techniques is where the field really needs to go. We need to uncover this dark matter, so to speak. On top of that, assigning or annotating the metabolome is very difficult, as, as diagrammed here. There is actually a very small molecular weight difference in terms of most metabolites that compose the metabolome, as this bar graph indicates. And this is the reason why mass spec requires GC or LC, because it's very difficult to differentiate or identify unique metabolites when they have very similar overlapping masses. We have the same problem in NMR. Uh, here is a chemical shift distribution of a roughly 1,200 metabolites. 
and human metabolomics database and you can see massive overlap very difficult to go ahead and identify unique metabolites even if you go into two dimensions like a 2d hsqc experiment that's shown here again we see a significant overlap most of the chemical shifts sit on this diagonal again showing the similarity between the proton and chemical shifts so again we have this high level of ambiguity this high level in terms of overlap that we're dealing with in terms of trying to identify metabolites from these complex heterogeneous mixtures. So as I've already pointed out, the metabolome is extremely sensitive to handling. There are numerous things that we can do that induces biologically irrelevant perturbations in the metabolome. And what I'm showing here is kind of just a little bit of a brain dump of some of the things that we have to decide upon but that are all gonna impact what our end results are. If we change the sample preparation with the time, buffer, pH, how I extract, lice my samples, how I get rid of any residual metabolites, how I collect my NMR spectrum, how many data points, how well things are shim, baseline correction, how I process and pre-treat statistical, how I do my alignment, deal with denoising, normalization, what multivariate model I apply, what analytical source I have, who's actually handling the samples, what validation I use, all these processes, all these decisions, all these parameters are variable, can lead to a perturbation in the metabolome that is not biologically relevant. Here's some dirty laundry that highlights this point. This is real data that I haven't published this for obvious reasons, that have come out in my particular group that simply again shows how sensitive the metabolome is and how sensitive the multivariate statistical techniques we use to highlight these differences. So here is a student um, preparing a whole bunch of different samples simultaneously. And they decided to go ahead and take a break for lunch from working up the samples in the morning to coming back later in the day and finalizing working up those samples and the largest variance in the data was when those samples were handled. The separation is based on morning and afternoon. Here's a situation where two students are working side by side, following the exact same protocol, um, but difference in terms of their technical skills or experience level, and the separation is clearly based on which student handled which particular sample. You know, issues like um, pipetting come into play in terms of highlighting this difference. So it's very easy, as this data shows, to get what appears to really impressive statistical variations in our data that has nothing to do with the underlying biology of the system you're trying to study, right? So again, when we're thinking about doing metabolomics, there's a number of factors that we need to really consider. First of all, we need to make sure that we get rid of, quench all enzymatic activities quickly, that means doing things fast, keeping things cold, also doing multiple extractions to make sure we get all the metabolome all over, right? Um, to avoid any type of bias, again, we need to randomize and be fast. We need to maximize our single noise. Noise is a really big problem with metabolomics. We need to correct variations in our biological samples in terms of aligning, um, dealing with pH differences, instrument instability, uh, address denoising. Again, noise is really problematic. It's clearly not biologically relevant. We have to normalize our sample. No sample, a biological sample is going to be um, consistent. So we're going to get different number of cells, different volume of urine or serum and so forth. We have to account for the fact that we have a huge dynamic range in our metabolites. Right, they're going to reflect huge concentrations, huge peak difference. And of course, we always need to make sure that we validate our statistical models. Right? So optimization of the sample preparation protocol is essential. This is the Achilles heel of metabolomics. If, any, if you get any message from what I'm talking about today, this is the most important point. If you can resolve this issue, if you can do this step uh, correctly, efficiently, and accurately, you're going to get reliable, reproducible data, right? And again, this process is very involved. It's very complicated. It's very time consuming. It's very manual. 
And every type of sample that you're going to use is going to require a different protocol. You might be able to establish some standard steps, but based on the nature of the cell line, eukaryotic, prokaryotic, whether or not it's a tissue, uh, biofluid is going to require a very distinct um, step. And like I said, what you have to worry about is making sure that every sample gets exposed to the exact same protocol that the same person is doing each individual step and that this entire process is done fast and it's done cold and it's uh, effective in terms of getting rid of all the enzyme activity and efficiently extracting the metabolites while getting rid of all cell debris, um, proteins, DNA, and, and so forth. And like I said, there's not one universal protocol that you can apply. Things get even more complicated when you start doing human or animal trials, when you're re relying on terms of biofluids. Uh, and again, in addition to having a very defined protocol and process that's going to be unique, Here's a protocol for looking at urine, which is going to be different in terms of how serum, which is going to be different than, say, how CSF or um, other biofluids are used in terms of the actual steps. The other important point that you have to identify is your cohorts, right? What are the criteria you're going to use for including and excluding a subject that's going to be part of this particular study? So not only do you have to worry about how the sample is collected, stored, handled, and processed, but you also have to consider all the permutations, all the variables that actually define the individual who provides that particular sample and what characteristics are going to allow you to go ahead and include or exclude a particular person. And all this needs to be done upfront and a priori, and all these factors are going to be unique and specific to whatever the study or project that you're actually doing in hand. On top of this, on top of the actual process of storing and handling the samples, there are other experimental parameters that you have to also consider. And one of those, and especially when the concept in terms of looking at cell lines, is the time point that you're going to go ahead and collect and harvest those particular cells. Because uh, if you have wild type cells and if you have mutant type cells, they don't all have the same type of growth profile. And if you collect at just a constant time, you're going to be collecting cells at very different points in their growth curve, and they're going to be emphasizing that aspect in terms of the difference. So time also becomes a characteristic, an important aspect. And it's the same thing in terms of with um, biofluids, with clinical trials, right? Do you collect urine in the morning? Do you collect urine after fasting? Uh, do you collect serum, you know, at the end of the day or so forth, depending on what the nature is. So you have to consider all these experimental parameters and make sure you're comparing apples to apples, that everything is in the same point in terms of the same states. So again, it's very, very easy to introduce bias because the metabolome is so sensitive to all these aspects in terms of the process. So consistency is probably the most important factor to consider. Every sample should be handled exactly the same way. Uh, that means you can't perturb or change anything. That means if you run out of a buffer, you, you can't change that in the middle because even though you're following the same recipe and even though you, you're the one preparing both buffers, those two buffers are not identical and can induce change. Even in terms of the actual disposable, right? If you pull up a different... Um, the uh, vendor number or different to manufacturer run, you can go ahead and induce changes in the actual process. You need to use the same incubators or shakers or possible. You need to randomize your, your samples if necessary in terms of how they're distributed across these very different samples across incubators or animal cages or habitats. Have to be at the optimal time to harvest each individual cell or tissue. You need to do things fast. You need to include a quenching step to get rid of all the residual uh, activity. You need to keep everything cold to maintain thermal and um, thermodynamic stability or avoid oxidation and so forth. Each step should be done by the same person at the same particular time. Randomize the samples. Randomize not only the samples going through the protocol, but each step of the process. 
again, if you just run all your healthy controls first and then you run all your disease groups second, you're going to introduce a timestamp bias in terms of the data. I have one sample used a phrase buffer and another set of sample used an old buffer. You're going to introduce a bias into the analysis, right? So this boils down to you want to be fast, cold, random, and uniform in the handling and processing of these metabolomic samples. And this is something that is just unavoidable in terms of the details and the complication in terms of doing metabolomics efficiently and accurately and reproducible. The other issue that we need to do, think about the field, and we're far from this. This is one of my goals and activities being part of MQAC and, and MANA is uh, need for standardizing protocols, data processing, and model validation. So one aspect to that approach, I've already introduced this. We have our own MVA pack software, which is a full data um, processing pipeline that goes from raw data to validate models, it's freely available from our particular website. Uh, again, it does all the important processes and steps of um, that's needed for um, metabolomics. Uh, importantly, it incorporates as part of the actual process is going to validate the significance of these statistical models. And I'll come back to highlight how really important is that you do proper model validation to make sure that you get a reliable outcome. We've also introduced a website for MVA PAC that kind of guides you through the entire process, taking you step by step uh, as diagram there, and also saving uh, the corresponding um, scripts and allowing you to interact and manipulate um, with the spectral data. And again, part of this uh, analytical chemistry paper that's under review. We have also implemented an entire new data processing pipeline to work with LCGCMS data. So MVA Pack now becomes the entire only software out there that can handle and do all the processing for both NMR and mass spec data, the full full processing pipeline. So, in addition to worrying about in terms of um, proper handling and storing of the metabolome, there are a lot of other fundamental questions they need to address and answer at the beginning of metabolomic study. And one of the most common questions I always get asked is how many replicates, right? How many samples do I need? What's the size of my cohort size if I'm doing a clinical trial? The simple answer is always the more is the better or as many as practical. Uh, the problem that we have with any type of omic study is that we have this very well characterized statistical problem of P versus N. That we have very few replicates, but we have very, very large number of observed variables, right? Hundreds and not thousands of observed variables, but maybe only 10, 20, or 100 um, replicates if I'm doing a very large cohort size. So as a result, and it's kind of summarized here, um, just through random statistic um, probability, I can have two peaks look like that they are fundamentally different between the two different groups, simply because I have so many variables and so few replicates. And this is simply summarizing the fact here that I take a simple analysis that there is a yes, no, 50-50 chance that a particular peak is going to be different. As soon as I have 128 NMR bins and only six replicates, I have guaranteed that at least one peak is going to show some level of relative intensity difference. But if I increase my number of replicates, eventually it goes to the point where the probability drops out, right? So we need to minimize this random chance of peaks looking different between two different groups by increasing my number of replicates. This becomes even more complicated and challenging when I'm looking at a clinical study. Now, there is well-defined standard statistics it's in terms of looking at uh, it's using statistical power, and normally we want to get a power of roughly about 80%, right, um, saying that we can differentiate between two groups at the 80% confidence level. And if you look at kind of standard variables that we might see in metabolomics, right, what's the standard deviation, what's the differences in the means, uh, a standard alpha p-value of 0.05, what this tells us is that we need somewhere in the neighborhood of about minimum 
of 60 participants per group. And very rarely do you see us actually doing this in the literature in the field. Uh, there's practical reasons behind that. Another reason why we want to maximize the number of replicates as diagrammed here, right? The significance of the group difference in those PCA plots increases proportional with the number of replicates, right? The more replicates I have to define a group, the more likely I can say that the group difference is significant. It's obviously very easy to differentiate that when the group variance becomes very large, but we're not usually out here. We're usually down here where we have overlapping groups and we want to say that they're different or not. Well, I can say they're different if I have a large membership in each particular group. Another thing that's critical that has to be done in all cases is no exception is that our data has to be normalized and scaled. And I, if you don't do that, our data is meaningless. And here's data that is not normalized and scaled. And this is what the data looks like after it's properly normalized and scaled, right? We have, normalization take, takes into factor that we have large differences in the number of cells, our volume of sample, and so forth. So we have to account for that. And scaling takes into fact that one metabolite might be 10 orders or more concentrated than another, and we have to put them all onto a standard platform. The problem we face in terms of uh, metabolomics is that there's a wide variety of different normalization techniques. Uh, we developed our own um, called PSC, which simultaneously does phase correcting and scatter correction, which is part of MVA PAC, because again, even very subtle phase distortions like this can lead to group variation that have nothing to do with the underlying biology. And we've shown that our normalization approach actually does much better than a lot of the standard approaches that we come very close to mimicking or capturing what would be the uh, ideal uh, response in terms of to renormalize our data. We also compared nine other normalization uh, methods and stressed it with some simulated NMR data. And what we observed is under um, limited stress, limited noise, or limited uh, amount of um, differences in terms of peak intensity, most of these normalization methods do equally well. And that's that's good to know, except for histogram matching, does awful, never use that technique. And I had never seen anything perform so poorly relative to this. But when we start looking at extreme circumstances, when we start looking at high noise, small group differences, and what we observed is that three normalization techniques um, did much weather, better than the rest, uh, including our PSC, and there was a listed down here. But you have to also keep in mind, even though these techniques do equally well in terms of um, dealing with noise and recovering peak intensity, they do do things differently, right? And the result is, is that the statistical models are going to be different depending on what normalization technique I see. So comparing PSC and PQ, we see that PS separation is primarily defined by different groups, or PQ separation is primarily orthogonal to the group separation, right? So the, this is the group separation, and this is obviously orthogonal to the group separation. So your choice impacts your, your statistical models, impacts your data, and so choosing the right normalization is still important. I already alluded to this. Noise is the bane to do any type of metabolomics omics. We discovered this early on, diagrammed here. I have ideal, perfect, near perfect data, right? Differentiating these NMR particular spectra. They don't fall on top of each other. We still see very large within group variants, even though the spectra look like this and they're very simple. We found out what's the source of variance. It is the randomness. In the noise, if we go ahead and remove the noise from the spectra, remove the noise region, we have collapsed the separation in terms of the group separation by a factor of five, right? If you look at the relative value here, we can see that even more dramatically here with NMR data in terms of the number of scans we use to collect the spectrum. As we increase the number of scans, increase the number of signal to noise, we see a, a beautiful linear decrease in the group within group variance as we're better defining um, the spectral difference. And of course, we get better group separation too. 
So increasing your signal, decreasing noise is fundamental. In fact, we were able to identify a particular point where noise becomes problematic. So in that comparison of the normalization factor, even with our best performing normalization, we see as soon as we get beyond 20% noise, our ability to correctly reproduce, right, the correct signals that are varied between the groups falls off, right? So 20% noise is going to be the um, limit in terms of what a statistical model can actually handle. So that also means we need to strive to improve our signal as best as possible. So one way in terms of a recent report is by using um, gadolinium-based paramedic relaxation enhancement to go ahead and increase our signal to noise. Unfortunately, the challenge behind this is that it was in uniform. While we saw in some cases upwards of twofold improvement in signal to noise, there are actually other cases where we saw a, a, a decrease. With um, 2D, we can do non-uniform um, sampling to also improve our signal to noise. So again, that's routinely um, um, recommended. I also made a point that validation of our statistical models are essential. Um, these models are designed to find differences. And as diagrammed here, if you actually just use noise, you can still get an excellent model separating these two groups, even though this is just noise. We also presented this a couple of years ago when we took PCA and LPLS, got real data, really nice group separation, but just started adding noise. PCA behaved as you expected, whereas more and more noise got in, greater within group and between group variance until you saw no separation. But techniques like PLS, OPLS still maintain group separation, but the um, similarity between the spectral features here and the spectral features here are basically non-existent. So even though this gave the appearance of a good model, good separation, it's just not finding anything of significance. So validation. So how do we validate? Well, one thing that we all report, which we should report, is the R squared and Q squared values, right? But the, these are not sufficient. They should be reported, but they don't validate a model. Technically, what you want to look for is that Q is typically greater than 0.4. R squared should be greater than, by, than Q squared, but if it's much greater, then it starts suggesting model overfitting. But again, as diagrammed here, this is an invalid model, but it's R squared and Q squared values are still on the acceptable range here. So you have to go ahead and do other validations. Uh, typical uh, um, means of doing that is um, leave N out uh, response permutation, as diagrammed here, which is again part of MBA PAC. You just simply replace your assignments, randomize your assignments, and see how much the R squared and Q squared deteriorates relative to ideal values. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we need to do right, is in terms of statistical validation is apply a multiple hypothesis to correction. Uh, whenever we're doing any type of omics, particularly metabolomics, we're identifying a set of metabolites that we believe are significantly different. But the error is additive. So each, even though each individual metabolite might have an alpha 0.05, the entire set is no longer significant because of this cumulative average. So you have to do a false discovery rate correction. Our, our preferred approach is the bentamani hotspur correction, but a more aggressive approach is using Bonferroni. And again, simply describing here, these are relatively simple tests. They can easily be done in something like Excel. Uh, on the Bonferroni, you simply take whatever your p-value is and divide it by the number of observable number of metabolites, and that becomes your new p-value. So this tends to be relatively aggressive. The Benjamin of Hotspur is a little um, simpler. Uh, you look at each individual p-value, identify the corresponding threshold itself. So in this particular case, um, uh, you still get some metabolites that are going to be significant as you're dividing the alpha by that particular metabolite number as described here, right? They're still significant, right? So again, we need um, to deal with a balance to avoid type 1 errors, false positive, but also avoiding type 2 errors, um, false negative. If you're interested, there's a nice article that came out a number of years ago that discusses this 
challenge in terms of FDR correction. <clears throat> the other thing we also have to do is we have to identify our group membership. Again, if I look at a PCA scores plot diagram here, I don't know what this tells me, but if I superimpose onto it ellipses corresponding to the 95% confidence limit, I can clearly start identifying where the various different groups are and group memberships are. On top of that, there's always a question. It's like, okay, is these two groups statistically significant? We need to go beyond this vision and saying, oh yeah, they look to be separate enough. We can go ahead and convert this into a distance matrix, apply uh, uh, phylogenetic approaches and get essentially a, um, a metabolome tree diagram and we can identify the statistical significance between each different clave and determine, yes, indeed, these two groups are statistically significant and actually assign a p-value. Again, this is part of our MBA pack software. Another question that usually comes up is that we have a whole bunch of different um, metabol um, chemometric methods, which is the best and which method to use. And the answer is that they, they obtain different information. So PCA is primarily identifying what's the major group variants right? But it doesn't necessarily tell you what you might be looking for. OPLS is going to separate based on group variants, and it's also going to separate out any um, non, um, or non-desirable variants in terms of the group. So typically what we do is we do a PCA to determine group variants, and then we do OPLS to determine what the nature of the source of that group variants. PLS is problematic because it co-mingles group variants with other um, unrelated covariants, like something like diet and so forth. But the point here is, is that people make this mistake all the time that OPLS is not superior to PCA because OPLS always seems to give group variants, but you have to validate that model. A lot of times if the PCA model is not group separation, OPLS is not gonna be valuable. We did a uh, comparative analysis to go ahead and look at the performance of five commonly used um, chemometric methods using simulated data. And the good news is that we found under normal circumstances where there's fairly reliable group differences, all the models for the most part performed well. When we start really stressing the data, putting a lot more noise and smaller group variation, that's when we observe that OPLS performed the best in terms of identifying group separation, right? The accuracy, as Ray pointed out, metabolite annotation and coverage is problematic um, because of um, the small chemical shift overlap. Uh, we've developed uh, an algorithm to automate the analysis of 1D NMR spectra um, that accounts for both chemical shift variation and uh, does a simultaneous fit entire the entire database. When we compare our method to some other methods, including um, available commercial software like Konomics and Basil, our approach always does better. But what we also identify is we increase the library size um, and the number of metabolites that are present in the mixture, everybody does substantially worse. And so this is always a challenge with analyzing and fitting 1D data this is why you really need to go ahead and incorporate 2D data to help validate. And we showed and demonstrated a, a methodology and approaches where we can go ahead and measure both uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon-based 2D data simultaneously. Uh, you get a broader coverage of metabolome because now we're seeing different types of metabolites and the various different type of um, spectra. We can also employ HSQC, HSQC Toxi, HMBC at the same time. Again, um, to increase our reliability, accuracy, and in terms of metabolite identification. HMB is particularly exciting because we can take that spectra and create a pseudo spectra by covariance. And so an HMBC spectra can be turned into essentially C13, C13 inadequate, and where we get the entire C13 chemical spectra of each unique metabolite. And then we can start thinking in terms of simplifying the automated analysis of our data based on this. Uh, the other practicality that we got to deal about with NMR, right? Chemical shift errors and accuracy. Konomics just highlights the fact that you change the pH slightly, 
chemical shifts change slightly and you get a very high large number of inaccurate assignments. Um, what we have started doing is tabulated the on the per resident basis, the chemical shift sensitivity, so we can identify what's the uncertainty or the errors associated with those particular um, peaks. But as I've pointed out multiple times before, we really should be combining NMR and mass spec together to increase the metabolome coverage. And it's very easy to go ahead and do that. Uh, essentially, the sample preparation at the very front end, you simply need to go ahead, follow that same protocol, and kind of split the sample between NMR and mass spec. And then the data analysis, statistical analysis, we can apply multi-block, same techniques, but now we put in the NMR data into one matrix, the mass spec in the next state matrix, uh, we can get uh, OPLS. We've developed an algorithm for this. We can also see the same separation using both NMR and mass spec data simultaneously. And this greatly improves the overall model. Here's real data showing that NMR by itself, mass spec by itself didn't really show great separation, but we got beautiful group definition of separation where we combine both NMR and mass spec to the data. And we routinely see this. And then on individual data with this combined model, we can see exactly from the NMR data and the mass spec data, which metabolites are um, both simultaneously and equally weighting in terms of showing what the difference is in terms of the groups. All right. Uh, again, by combining NMR and mass spec, we can greatly uh, increase metabolome coverage. This is an example looking at um, drug treatment in terms of algae to introduce um, fatty acid production. And when we did the analysis by, by, by mass spec initially, right, there are a lot of holes. But when we got, went ahead and combined the NMR data, we were able to actually cover nearly 100% all the metabolic processes that were perturbed by this drug and got a complete overview and coverage of the metabolome. So again, I can't stress the value in terms of combining both NMR and mass spec. And even in this particular case, where the mass spec was not calibrated, this is untargeted, under most circumstances, we received a relatively reasonable correlation for those metabolites that were detected by both NMR and mass spec. So a final point is, is that we're moving to the next level where we're doing multi-omics data sets. Not only are you doing NMR and mass spec, lipidomics and proteomics, but we're also incorporating proteomics to get a true overview coverage of the perturbation in the system. Again, this is a new novel drug um, targeting tuberculosis that we wanted to go ahead and try to identify and validate what the in-cell lethal target was. And my student who was working on this project uh, said that as she looked at each individual data set, she was getting a very different perspective and a view in terms of what was going on. It wasn't until she combined all the omics data that she saw the true um, impact of what the drug was having. So again, um, briefly summarizing all the things that we kind of talked about, highlighting the fact that metabolomics itself is actually relatively complex. There are numerous sources of errors in terms of the sample handling, statistical data analysis, things that we need to do and consider in terms of getting out reliable and reproducible um, data. Um, and where the field needs to go is that we need to identify and establish best practices, consensus protocols, so that we do get reproducible results across um, groups, across studies, um, both how the sample is prepared, how the data is collected, how the data is um, processed and analyzed. Uh, we need to, again, identify robust and reproducible structural techniques, uh, statistical techniques, establishing QA and QC, maximize our sensitivity, maximize our number of reports, and also deposit our data set. So with that, I want to thank my group, uh, all my students who are involved in this particular project, all contributed to various different uh, aspects and, of course, our funding agency. And at the end, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. And hopefully you found this um, tutor tutorial interesting and informative, and you're going to be able to go ahead and apply some of these best practice ideas to your own uh, metabolomics projects. Again, thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, it was a very informative talk and uh, really goes into a lot of depth on the uh, more analytical side where 
uh, I think it's easy to go into a lot of the physical side of, of NMR when we uh, talk about it here. Uh, so uh, please go ahead and uh, put some questions in the Q&A. I can see some of them are already coming in. While that happens, I'm going to uh, go ahead and ask uh, one myself. Um, so when you discuss the metabolomic uh, dark matter, um, there's a very large number that um, that was suggested that we aren't really seeing. So I was wondering, is a is some what section of that is describing short-lived species that are just difficult to probe? And is that uh, short-lived because they're short-lived in vivo or short-lived after extraction as well? Uh, just kind of just want to pick your brain a little bit on that. Sure, actually that's a great question and one that's probably difficult to give an absolute answer to. Uh, mm -hmm. I would say, I would think that the vast majority of that dark matter probably constitutes short-lived metabolites. You know, if you, if you think or, or look at any um, kind of traditional metabolic process network, um, there are kind of nodes, right? There are specific type of metabolites that tend to be easily detectable. Their presence in a relative abundance, um, you know, say in the TCA cycle or in glycolysis, where there are other metabolites that are very difficult to see because of the, they just concert, convert um, really quick, you know, really very readily and quickly into their into their product. So I, I think that's where a lot of that dark matter is. I right? very quickly transformed. So I think where the field is going, and one of the things that's going to be advantageous is going to be a computational modeling of the entire metabolic process, where we measure the nodes by NMR mass spec and other techniques, right? The detectable, relatively abundant and prevalent metabolites. And then by knowing factors in terms of what are the, you know, enzymatic um, factors, um, in terms of their turnover rate and so forth, that the rest of the metabolome can then be computationally modeled based on what we observe experimentally. Mm -hmm. Does that help? Yeah, it does. Um, so we have a question here from Samir saying, thank you for the talk. Uh, can I please ask the reference on the paper comparing the basal uh, canomics and other methods? I think you might've. Okay, so. I think I had that reference on the slide. Yeah. I'll go back to that really quickly. It's a statistical journal right here. It's in Biostatistics, published in 2022, and it's a, an electronic version, so that's the, the ID down here. Thank you. Um, then uh, Nasreen says, uh, Great talk, Dr. Powers. Uh, do you have an example where metabolomics is integrated with other omics data, such as genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, to provide a comprehensive understanding of biological systems? And, and the answer is yes. Of course, I went through at the very end because I was running late mm -hmm. here of examples. But the this slide right here, this is a recently published JAX paper which does exactly that. It combines lipidomics, metabolomics, and proteomics using both NMR and mass spec to identify the actual lethal target of a, of a novel um, drug for TB, right? So mm -hmm. this, this is one example that, that we have that I think answers that question. All right, and then we have a, another question here. Um, from Pooja saying, thank you for the amazing talk. Uh, what about the use of Metabo Analyst uh, for NMR data analysis? Also, uh, in that platform, they use uh, Q-squared and R-squared value for PLSDA model validation. What can one do about it? So we use Metabo Analyst all the time, and so I highly recommend it. And I know David Wichard and his group very well. So, you know, that's all... Um, important and, and it's a, a valuable asset and tool. So definitely definitely um, take advantage in terms of utilizing that. And I think the point I would like to make is that the Q squared and R squared values are important in terms of 
understanding the quality of your model, right? You want to make sure you do have a high R squared and Q squared, and that the R squared is greater than the Q squared. But I, I do believe that, and I'm not a user, my students use the software themselves, but I do do believe David does, uh, the tabulina this does provide a um, permutation test, right? And at worst, if there isn't, you can obviously simulate it that yourself because all you're doing with the cross permutation test is taking n number of your um, replicates and randomly misassigning those, right? So if you have 10 replicates of your control and 10 replicates is your, let's say, drug treatment, and you misassign, say, one in each group and then resubmit that, that statistical model should yield a lower R squared and Q squared than when everything is properly assigned if your model is truly is true and valid. So, but I think he does have that ability to do that automatically, where it will simply generate like a random permutation values in a set of, say, a thousand different permutations and recalculate the R squared and Q squared. And the hope is that in all those thousand re, um, recalculated, the R squared and Q squared are significantly less than the the value in terms of with your with your true model, right? And again. I think I, I can go back to the slide that was showing or highlighting that particular point. Not right here, right? So this is clearly how it, that type of summary would be represented, right? Where you get all the R, all these are thousand or so dots of all the R squared and Q squared values relative to the ideal value which is shown up here and so you can see all of these permutations are much smaller than the actual true values in this particular case the p-value between these sets is um, relatively small thank you um, we have a question from uh, carol asking uh, what pulse sequence and value of the parameters do you suggest for 1d 1h uh, and why is there not standardization uh, well, I, I, I don't have an, let me, I don't have an answer for the second question. Um, and except for the fact that I think most of us, especially when we're new in any, any type of a field that rely on what the literature, um, has published. And so there's kind of a tendency to keep on propagating what people have done before. And since it's published, relying on the fact that that must be the best way and true way to go ahead and um, and to do things. Um, regarding point one, that's actually a good question. Something that we're actually my student has been um, evaluating recently over the last couple of months, looking at the impact of a variety of different experimental parameters, um, for instance, the number of data points and so forth. And we hope to go ahead and, and, and publish that 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 soon. Uh, so I can't give you a definitive answer, but kind of just look for that comparison where we do look at every common primary experimental parameter in terms of setting up a 1D NMR experiment, including comparing a couple of different pulse sequences and determining which factors do impact the resulting model and which don't. A lot of factors really don't. Um, but uh, it's a little bit premature and I can't really give you an honest answer since I don't have all the data in front of me. But we've been, we have been extensively looking at that and comparing that for the same reason that you're asking that question is that we haven't really, haven't gone back to these fundamental questions. And so we're trying to do that. Yeah, I guess that uh, segues well into one of the questions that I had of which mostly answered already. Uh, but just in terms of NMR collection time, does that cause a fairly major problem when you move from 1D to 2D NMR? Because uh, presumably with with 1D, the the expectation is you can probably measure a lot more quickly than doing the the 2D collection. And as we already showed earlier, the the time is a is a huge factor when it comes to what the results you you get out. So, so that's correct. Um, and so one way to try to address that is doing non-uniform sampling. You know, probably I, we, we go to probably about the 25% level 
So that gives you about a fourfold um, decrease in terms of the actual total time. Uh, the other thing is with 2D experiments, because of practical considerations, you're probably going to do a limited number of experiments relative to 1D. A lot of times the 1D experiments is what we're using to see the difference in the multivariate models and the 2Ds are there primarily to improve our confidence level and the annotation of the metabolites that we're seeing in the, in the 1D. Uh, the other thing that we'll do with 2D is pool samples to maximize the sensitivity. Again, because we're primarily focusing on annotation and identification, not quantification, that's not an issue or concern. Um, but it, yeah, you're right. Um, time is a consideration, right? You can't do, unless you have um, unlimited resources, very difficult to do like a thousand um, 2D experiments where it's practical to do a thousand 1D experiments. We have a follow-up question from Carol asking, uh, what do you mean by uh, redundant spectral information in NMR? Oh, again, another good question. Um, and it's mainly in, in comparison with, say, LC or GCMS data, right? When you're, more often than not, when you're looking at in terms of annotating a metabolite with mass spec data, you have a single spectral feature, right? You have a single MO received value. And people have shown that, especially in complex systems like metabolomics, a single M, M over Z value, when the number gets larger, can be consistent with hundreds, if not thousands, of different um, molecular formulas. So it becomes um, difficult to get an accurate annotation. But with NMR, uh, except for very simple um, small molecules, most molecules are going to have multiple peaks present in the spectrum. Uh, easily four or five, six, sometimes tens, dozens of peaks, all associated with the same particular metabolite. And they all should have similar um, response to whatever the uh, drug or environmental stressors are. So that gives you, that's where the redundancy comes from, right? You have different peaks in different regions of the specter that are all, that you can all associate with the same metabolite which you don't really get very easy from a traditional LCMS. You really need to go to MSMS, and now you're looking at individual fragmentation patterns, and that's what's normally done. So with NMR, we do 2D NMR to validate our metabolite annotations. With mass spec, you do MSMS to help validate the metabolite annotation. And then, uh... Pooja uh, coming in saying, thank you for the valuable insights for my question. Uh, I have two more questions. Uh, do you think uh, ICO shift for uh, pH difference is important for NMR data analysis? And two, is it possible to see the upregulation of most of the set of metabolites in one of the NMR sample compared to another, or compared to the other, given that all the steps have been followed according to the literature? So, um... But I can tell you that trying to account for pH shifts, chemical shifts due to pH differences is, is challenging to do and does require a lot of intense manual um, analysis of the actual spectrum. So as best as possible, and again, nothing is perfect, that we try to control or normalize the pH up front. Um, pHing, even if it's manually, pHing a, a few dozen or even more than that in terms of NMR samples before you actually collect the data uh, is probably smaller time commitment than sitting there at the, um, at the computer trying to do the data analysis and trying to accommodate or fit chemical shift difference after, after the fact. So um, I, at, the, at the end of the day, you probably have to do both. But I think uh, much planning or doing a little work up front to control pH variance is probably a, a, a better um, better approach. Now, uh, can you repeat the, the other question? Oh, I wasn't yeah. sure what the other question so was again. The second one is, is it uh, possible to see the upregulation of most of the set of metabolites in one of the NMR samples compared to the other, 
uh, given that all the steps have been followed according to the literature. So, so uh, I, I guess I'm not really sure that what what the question is intending. But if if we're talking about seeing peaks or having in one spectra and having peaks being missed in another spectra, um, I mean, of course, that that's always the possible possible outcome. And if, you know, obviously, it could be biologically real. Right? We have seen that. We have seen in, in the um, situations where, in one circumstance, a metabolite is highly upregulated and it's just huge abundance and in the other group it's barely there and not even detected so i can fully say we've had examples or something like that is 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 real and of course if you're following all the proper protocols you're going to avoid any uh, bias that might introduce that problem uh, the the biggest the biggest likelihood of that occurring is normalization right if you have a very large abundance of cells in one group and the other group has very limited number of cells, you can get a very incorrect bias, bias view. But that was a surprise outcome to us when we looked at the normalization factors is that all the parameters actually do very well in terms of correcting or recap, uh, recapturing um, the relative true intensity in terms of that, that type of variance. It's really noise that causes a, a problem. So if you if you uh, if you you know design your experiment well, you're not really off by a huge magnitude in say the number of cells or the volume of urine that you're collecting, and you use one of the, any one of the relatively robust normalization techniques, then that type of difference that you'd see, I would say, is probably truly biologically relevant. All right. Then we have a, another question from uh, here from uh, Gorav. Sorry, apologize for mispronouncing. Uh, thanks for the very elaborate lecture. Uh, I wonder uh, if for, for performing nosy PR1D experiments on uh, media samples, uh, what should the recommended protocol for, be for sample preparation? I think that is the, the question. Well, I, I think this gets back to. Um... The question that was um, asked earlier uh, about, you know, ideal experimental parameters and so forth. And so I know that 1D nosy is it has been a default application in terms of metabolomics since the very get go. And what I can tell you is that we prefer not to use um, 1D nosy. Uh, I, I know the choice was viewed as <clears throat> as a means to get better. Um, solvent subtraction um, suppression but what we have identified very early on is that um, uh, the excitation sculpting approach uh, to 1d protein nmr does orders of magnitude better than the 1d nosy and since the 1d nosy literally is the first fit of a 2d experiment uh, even though you're probably setting your relaxation time down to zero you still have some of that evolution that's going on, so that we we are going to show that the uh, that the one D excitation sculpting experiment does work better in terms of um, better stability and better reproducing the actual uh, the tabulum that we see. So that would be my that would to be perfectly honest, my point would be go away, get away from the one D nosy. And get to using the um, 1D excitation sculpting pulse sequence. And if you guys are using Brooker, it is a um, standard pulse sequence in their in their package. So that would be my my suggestion. Yeah, I've similarly recently come to that conclusion as well that I really appreciate the excitation sculpting. Yeah, um, it's, it really is. <laughs> It's an amazingly efficient solvent suppression, and it's a couple of decades old, and for some reason, it kind of got lost in the NMR community there. Uh, people aren't well aware of it, so use that use that pulse sequence or a permutation of it. Strongly suggested or encouraged. 